morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today's session. Uh, my name is Chris Fantine, Chief Technologist for the Western Region at Red Hat. And I've been with Red Hat for about 11 years, working with strategic partners and customers who are adopting uh, Red Hat's emerging technologies. Red Hat has uh, certainly moved well beyond Linux and the middleware, software-defined storage, virtualization, and container and cloud management. And certainly, you know, one of the hot topics uh, with our customers is around Docker and Linux containers. And our customers are typically asking us questions like, you know, containers ready for the enterprise? Uh, are containers secure? And how do we uh, scan and audit containers as well? And so in today's talk, I'm going to talk about some of the business drivers uh, that are driving this transition to a DevOps container world, as well as talk about Linux container technology, talk about security in terms of uh, the context of containers. Uh, feel free to ask questions as we move along. I started my career at Intel, and you know, only the paranoid survived is a famous quote from Andy Grove. It talks about you know how companies arrive at strategic inflection points, and you know it can either make or break a company. fail. And those who actually strive and adapt and change and evolve uh, will actually succeed. And so I think that's very relevant, in kind of what's going on in today's world, you can look at many different industries. Does anybody recognize what this is a picture of? Tesla or something? Tesla. Right, this is the Tesla automobile factory. And the reason I show this isn't just the software that's enabling uh, this factory to be automated, but also the vehicles that are produced in this factory. I mean, when was the last time you could go to a dealer and drive off your car knowing in 6, 12, 18 months down the road that vehicle would actually improve and get better? I'm sure you've read about how the zero to 60 time for these vehicles has been improved by a software update or their navigation system or the applications. Or even better, they have the ability to do a vehicle recall remotely by issuing a software update in some cases, saving them millions of dollars. And what happens you know, to industries that rest on their laurels, are complacent, and don't evolve? Well, I think the San Francisco taxi industry is a perfect example of what can happen. Right, when Uber and Lyft entered the market a few short years ago, a taxi driver averaged around 1,500 rides a month. This since plummeted by 65% as of two summers ago, and I'm sure it's gotten a lot worse. Right? And the mobile application has enabled them to offer a better user experience to their end customer. And so this is putting a lot of increased pressure, the business that is, on a corporate IT. Right? to not become the bottleneck. And so IT needs to evolve. And as a result, you know, the how, what, and where of application development processes, application architecture, and the underlying infrastructure is evolving to provide better agility and improve quality as well. And there's a shift away from these monolithic developed applications that are released maybe every year, two, three years, to one where you have very frequent releases, maybe every couple of weeks, and these are developed with a DevOps process in culture and leverage microservices rather than having a huge monolithic application so you can minimize the amount of change, reduce the risk of it causing a failure, and in the end, enable the business to deliver applications a lot faster. And so, you know, containers are a big part of this shift because they're in the mix of a critical problem. On the left side, you have the business pushing the developers to release features more rapidly in a matter of minutes or hours rather than weeks or months. And on the right side, you have operations and security. They're in charge of enforcing security compliance, enforcing standards, and they're being seen as a bottleneck because they're limiting choice. Typically, you have to go through you know, change control, to make a change to the environment. And so the developers are looking for other avenues, and you'll see shadow IT rising a lot of organizations. They're going to public cloud, building out their own infrastructure. And so containers are a big part of removing this friction because containers provide the promise of enabling the developers to develop at their own pace, be able to incorporate the dependencies into the container image without the restrictions placed 
on by the operations and security and still enabling those teams to control the host level security. And so that's the promise of containers is that both of these worlds can coincide and get the things that they need in terms of development, having access to the tools that they need, as well as being able to rapidly deliver software applications for the business. While on the right side, operations and security can still enforce their security standards. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, a little bit more about the technical details around containers, but also from a security perspective as well. So let's take a look at Linux containers. You know, one of the key things when a new technology comes to fruition in the industry is there's a lot of uh, arguing and, and fighting and jousting over the standards. And one of the things that the container industry has done is it's come together very early in its life cycle to eliminate those uh, conflicts and come together in a body called the Open Container Initiative. This is a governance structure for Linux containers in terms of runtime as well as the container image format. And so they came together and agreed on the standards and Docker contributed their code and their technology for both the runtime as well as the container image. And so this group will be coming out with uh, reference uh, runtime called Run C. And then all these companies can actually develop their own runtimes and they have the assurance that the image format will run on these compliant runtimes. And so it's bringing the whole industry together and enabling us to focus on real uh, business changing use cases rather than technology formats. And so what are Linux containers? You know, some of the key things is you know, they enable you to package in your software with all your dependencies, but more importantly, they allow you to package this image in a format once and then be able to deploy it anywhere, whether it's physical, virtual, public or private cloud. And so from a development perspective, when I build out this image, that image can last the full life cycle of that application. I don't have to have my testers rebuilding it or my operations team rebuilding it. They take exactly what I built and move that into test and then graduate it into production as well. So really improving the quality over time as well as being able to rapidly move these container images into production and allowing and freeing up testers to do what they best, testing the application, enabling developers to do what they best, building applications and, and writing them, and then operations to really monitor and do root cause analysis and troubleshooting. And so, you know, Linux containers have been around for a little while, but it wasn't until Docker came along and produced these standards around an API, around a runtime and an image format that you saw a mass adoption in the industry. And so certainly out in the West Coast, we see a lot of early adopters. We even see some companies going all in over the next year to two uh, years in terms of their production environment. And so what is the key difference uh, between a traditional operating system and a container architecture? Really, two fundamental things I want to focus on today in terms of uh, the security discussion is one, on the left side, you traditionally had your applications, whether they're running as processes side by side, sharing a common set of libraries on the system. In a container architecture, those libraries for the application and the dependencies are put into the container image. Secondly, on the left side, you had a single kernel per virtual machine or physical system, whereas on the container architecture, you have all the containers sharing the same kernel. And so that has a lot of implications from a security perspective, right? If you patch the kernel on a container environment, that impacts all the containers. If there's a vulnerability in the kernel, it could impact all the containers and the host on that particular system. So key difference versus uh, a virtual machine environment, where a virtual machine has its own uh, kernel as well as the host having its own kernel. And so there are additional layers and protection from a security perspective versus a container environment. 
And so what are some of the underlying technologies to enable containers on a Linux system? And here are a few key ones. One is control groups, right? Control groups was initially developed by Google many years ago, and they contributed to the open source and the Linux community, and they provide you to limit the resource consumption by a process on a physical or a virtual system. And so think of that, you can have many containers sharing a single system and you can still control the quality of service and deliver an SLA to your customers because that can limit the amount of network, memory, CPU, et cetera, that that process consumes. And so that allows all these containers to live side by side on a particular uh, virtual machine or host. Also, namespaces. This provides process isol isolation. Uh, so enabling you to have multi-tenancy on a particular system. Right? So process ID won't conflict in the uh, container that it does on the host, or eventually a user ID as well. And then also, from a security perspective, how do we encapsulate a container and contain it to our best of our ability on a host system and allow these containers to live side by side. Well, SE Linux is an important part of providing mandatory access control. So processes are limited in what files and resources that they can have access to on a system. In terms of the image format, Containers use a, uh, a layered image format. It's copy on write. So typically, as you build an image, you'll have a base image. Maybe it's a rel 6 or a rel 7. And then on top of that, you would maybe layer on your application stack, maybe a JBoss or Apache. Uh, but then you would have maybe your configurations, and that would create another layer on a copy on write. Anytime you write to it, it wouldn't impact the base or your application layer, it actually created an additional layer, right? And so the sum of these layers is what your container image is. And so it's very modular and flexible. And so, you know, what are the challenges that customers are saying as they adopt containers in the enterprise, right? So some of the early adopters have given us feedback, and the number one uh, concern and challenge is security, right? And there's good reason for that. Because as you pack more applications onto a system, there's a lot more risk of having negative impact of other business units or other applications. And so you want to make sure your applications are rather secure from your network perspective, your image perspective as well. And the kernel can, is a single point of failure in a container-based environment. So you better have a good patching mechanism, and you better have good isolation and making sure things like SE Linux are enabled as well. And so, you know, over the years I've worked with many uh, customers and when I first joined Red Hat, talked a lot about system patching. And Silicon Valley, one of the common responses to me was patch, you know, all our servers are behind the firewall. That is our security. And after, you know, looking in the news, a couple years ago, this is from 2014. You know, take a look at these logos. What do they all have in common? Right? They all had security breaches in 2014. They represent over a billion data records breached that year. Right? I think these are you know, worldwide uh, known brands. And you think they have the best talent in IT in many cases, to, to address these concerns, but yet they're still getting hacked, right? They have their, a target on their back in some cases, but a lot of issues around security at some marquee names. And so when you take a look at what are the top three reasons for data loss in 2014, one is malicious outsiders, two, accidental loss, but thirdly, you know, malicious insider attacks. I talk with a lot of CIOs, and they say that's a big concern that they didn't take seriously uh, before a lot of these public breaches, because the root cause for many of these are their unpatched servers as well, or malicious insider attacks. 
And so that brings us to container security. As we're rolling out a new technology, it's important to understand the security implications. And Dan Walsh, uh, a Red Hat employee who leads our SE Linux and our Docker team on the engineering side, uh, came up with a, an analogy for container security uh, along with the, the three little pigs story. And so in this analogy, you know, the pigs are the applications, the wolf is the security breach, and the infrastructure are the different types of places to live. And so in the first example, you know, physical servers are like houses. Right? They're the most secure besides having an air gap uh, environment. And when one server gets hacked, you don't worry about the other second or third server because you feel it's, it's pretty contained and isolated. Instead, you would believe that you know, the wolf actually has to break into each individual house because it has its own separate walls. Similar to a physical server, it has its own uh, kernel, and so you would have to get into those other servers. The disadvantage here is that you know, it's expensive, right? You have uh, three different servers, three sets of walls, et cetera. Another example you know, is the duplex. This is more like a virtual environment. You have a shared wall. Each virtual machine has its own kernel. Pretty good security. but at the expense of some performance, right? It's not as optimized. And from an attack perspective, you would have to attack, for instance, a vulnerability in the virtual machine kernel. Uh, then you would have to get into KVM, then break through SVIRT to get to the host kernel. And so there are multiple layers of protection in that type of system. Now, apartment is like containers with separation, right? Each container is the different apartments in this building. Yet in this apartment, the front desk has, is the kernel, and it has keys to all the apartments. So if you attack the front desk, you can get access to all the individual containers process talks to the kernel, they talk to that front desk, and if there's a bug in the Linux kernel, then it's an impact all these different apartments, right? And a hostel is similar to a service running on the same host. And so in terms of security, you need to have SE Linux running, because if you don't, that's really like you know, sleeping in the park. You're very vulnerable to attack. How many of you enable SE Linux on your systems? Yeah. So in a container world, it's definitely very important to have SE Linux enabled. And that's one of the things that Red Hat provides in its distribution of Docker. And the reason behind this is you know, Dan Walsh Again, it talks about how containers do not contain. And a key reason is that all resources are namespaced. And so resources that are, that are namespaced are mapped to a separate value in the container versus the host. So think about user IDs, process IDs, kernel key ring, the kernel itself, and modules, devices, and the system time are things that are not namespaced. Now, there's a lot of work in terms of UIDs that's un, up, or underway upstream, and it's a tech preview in our latest version of Red Hat, uh, but it's not ready for prime time in the enterprise yet in terms of full support. And so some of the security risks of containers are kernel, kernel exploits, uh, DOS attacks, uh, container breakouts, poison images, as well as compromised secrets. And we'll talk about uh, some of these in more detail as we walk through. First, let's start out with container images. You know, first off, you know, what insi what's inside the container matters. A lot of developers, probably in your organization, are pulling down different container images from the Docker GitHub. Red Hat did an analysis of all the images, and 
of the images on Docker Hub contain a high priority security vulnerability. All right, just things like shell shock, heart bleed, etc. So when you're pulling down from the public internet, you need to be aware of what are you pulling down? What's inside that image? Who built the image? Not only at the time of pulling it down, but over the life cycle. And so let's take a look at, at this example. Here, one of the beauties of uh, you know, containers, it supports any programming language. So you have C, Java, uh, Node.js, PHP, Perl, et cetera. And the orange boxes and the gray boxes show you the different libraries or components, dependencies that were pulled into the image for these particular uh, container images. So on the left, you have uh, glibc being pulled in with the C application, and et cetera. And the little triangle, what that shows you is how many security notifications Narada were released since GA of RHEL 7. My eyes are going a little bad, but the numbers are quite large. I think over 30 for like uh, Java notifications. And so the key point is here, once you pull down an image, it might be secure at that day of time, but I can assure you probably in six months there will have been some notifications and some security issues. So as an operations team, I better be engaged with my development team about coming up with a process and have tooling around auditing and updating applications over time, whether it's issuing a new container or patching a container. In a DevOps world, most likely you'll be rolling forward and just issuing a new container image rather than fixing the existing one. And here shows you in 2014, you know, where are the security notifications happening? And look what number one is. The kernel, right? The kernel is a critical part of a container infrastructure. Likewise, you know, Java, certainly uh, one of the top ones, along with some other application components as well. So the key message is here is, you know, the kernel is at high risk, and you can see there's been a lot of uh, issues around the kernel, as well as the programming languages. So in a container world, uh, those are two critical components, and there's a need to have you know, compliance and vulnerability audits for these container images. And so the rest of the discussion, I talk about OpenSCAP, which is an open source, open standard tooling available out on many different Linux platforms <coughs> to provide the ability to audit container images for security vulnerabilities, as well as see if they're compliant with security policy that you may have defined for your environment. And so first off, you know, there's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. This is a, a government agency which you know, maintains and releases notifications about security vulnerabilities for major uh, software applications, including uh, Linux. And they also provide a l series of checklists for security policy standards for the operating system as well, including Linux. And so this data can be used by tooling to check physical, virtual, or containers for security vulnerability issues or policy checks as well. And so I'm sure uh, if you're on the operations side, you're familiar with a CVE. CVE is a, a common vulnerability exposure notification. It will tell you, for instance, for Linux, that there's a security issue uh, with a component. What's the priority? What are the versions that are impacted, what do you need to uh, upgrade to in order to address this particular issue? You know, why is this issue particularly important uh, for my environment as well? And then there's also 
uh, common configuration enumeration. So these are the checklists. This is a series of policies. For instance, this one is a policy around setting the password minimum length on a system or in a container. And so you can take this set of CCEs and actually check your containers or check your system to see if they're properly configured to meet this requirement in the checklist. If not, you know, it gets flagged and notified. And so OpenSCAP is a set of content, a scanning tool, and reporting. From a content perspective, it's taking the CVs, the CCEs, along with a security guide for your distribution of Linux, in this case, uh, the RHEL SCAP security guide. That content is used by the tooling. In this case, OpenSCAP, there's a series of tools uh, that OpenSCAP uh, provides. In the Red Hat world, we have a Red Hat network satellite to scan across a data center or data centers of systems. And then the reports that are generated by these tools will inform the operations team around vulnerability issues with images, as well as where the checklist failed as well. In terms of security compliance, yes. Great idea, love it. Um, set the context, though. Is this something that we're doing as I guess at release time? So you, you, you basically got the stuff that you're releasing, and you say, "Hey, I want to look at this. I want to scan this before I approve it." Or are you going into a, a live environment, a production environment, whatever kind of environment, and you say, "I want to look at all those things over there," and even though they're up and running, I'm still going to do my analysis. Sure. Is it sort of the test tube, or is it? That's a great question. So the, the tooling can be inserted wherever you want it in your process, your, uh, your workflow. Uh, I would recommend certainly at part of your build process. Right, that's the, the critical thing. You might also have times where you want to run it in a live environment. Uh, I'll run through some use cases after this, but it also works offline or on, with online images. Uh, so use case number one, you know, scan for compliance. And today I'm talking about a container images, but it can be applied to physical, virtual, or containers as well. And so some of the things you may have in terms of scanning for compliance are password quality uh, requirements set on this instance, are obsolete services enabled, such as Telnet, is OpenSSH properly configured, you know, is slash temp on a separate partition. So these are the CCs that may be in your policy checklist. And so what you would do is you can download the OSCAP tooling. Uh, this is an example of the command line version. Um, and then you can actually run this on your particular system. This I'm doing on a physical system. And here you can see it's going through each check. Disable host-based authentication, disable SSH root login, and you can see it passed or failed these particular policy checks. And at the end of this run, I can bring in my browser, the evaluation report, which provides details. And I can actually drill down into a high level compliance and scoring analysis. So you can see 34 passed. Uh, I had three high uh, failures. And now I can actually drill down into the actual failures. And so here you see a more detailed report of every check it did and the result. Now I can select on any one of these. Let's focus on one of the failures. And here I selected on uh, this password failure. And what you'll notice, it talks about the check, but also it provides a remediation script. So it can automatically resolve this issue on the image, VM, or the physical system. And so I could click here and it actually resolve that check. And so it changes uh, the password length. 
So that's uh, use case number one. Use case number two for the OpenSCAP tools is scanning for known vulnerabilities. Right? This is checking those images to make sure that they don't have components that are out of date and have security, known security vulnerabilities. So what RPMs need updating? You know, what is the criticality of the vulnerability? What is the vulnerability? And what CVEs have not been applied and addressed? And so in this case, I can see uh, the buying security update notification. I can see the packages as well as the details. And this is showing you the Red Hat Security Advisory, which maps to one of the NIST CVEs or multiple NIST CVEs. And one of the things that in, in the Red Hat world that we do is we backport patches to older version number releases. And so just because uh, a CV says you have to be on a newer version, that necessarily isn't the case of using Red Hat distribution because we may have backported the fix into an older numbered version of a component. And so it's important to uh, be aware of that and check out the RHSA as well as the CVs so you don't get any false positives. And so in this example, I'm going ahead and scan using the OSCAP tool. Uh, so I'm going to scan for any CV. And on the right side, you can see I'm running on the CLI. The scan, you can see the pass fails. And then at the end, you could actually view the report. And for the CV audit, I can actually uh, pull up a summary for this particular system. And then I can view line by line the different checks and see the ones in the red there. There's a, an actual issue on this particular system being out of date as well. And then use case number three is uh, particular for containers. You know, So is the Docker image compliant? Is the Docker image patched? Uh, is the Docker container compliant? And is the, uh, the Docker container patched? So a difference between image, meaning at rest, and a container, meaning a running instance of that image. So offline as well as online. And so in this example, there's an upstream utility called the OSCAP Docker. Went ahead and downloaded that from GitHub. When it installed the different components for Docker. And I'm gonna pull down a RHEL 6.2 image and run that as a container and then run Two things, one is I'm gonna run the offline scan, so the image at rest, that's the top example. And so I generated a report of that offline image. To your point, you know, can you, where do you insert it in the process? I could have the flexibility of doing offline or online. And so that second one uh, runs a scan for a live running container on a physical host in this example. Now we talked about the policy checklist. You can also customize what NIST is giving you from a content perspective and either enable or disable these different checks. And so there's a utility called the SCAP Workbench which provides a tool to actually adjust your policy for your environment. So this allows the system administrator to actually customize it. Maybe some of the policy checks are not really uh, relevant to your infrastructure. Uh, the upstream project for OSCAP also has worked on an Anaconda add-on so that you can insert this scan at build time. So a lot of different options as to where you insert this check. This one, the Anaconda add-on, is available. And as a part of the build process, it'll actually do the scan. So from the get-go, uh, you will actually have a system that's compliant to your policy as well as a check for your CVEs. And so, in summary, you know, what are some container best practices from a security perspective? Only run the container images from trusted parties. Right? Be aware of where you're pulling down these images. 
Many enterprises I'm working with are setting up their own private instance of a Docker Hub, or running their own registry. Also, you know, by default, container images is typically running on its root. So you want to be aware of what that implication is, right? Root in the container, then they can get root on the host uh, without user namespace. And then also, you know, the host operating system matters because the kernel is even more important in a containerized environment and the security risks of a breach of the kernel than versus a, a virtual machine environment. So you want to be aware of what, you, what your developers are getting into. Also, apply security uh, fixes to your kernel. Have a process and tooling for scanning and updating your container images, whether they're online or offline. Uh, you know, SE Linux, a very critical part of your Linux container environment. And then make sure you're checking your container images on an ongoing basis. At build time or once you pull it down is not good enough, but you have to be checking on a regular basis as new security notifications are released. And if you'd like to find out some additional information, here's some resources uh, to help you. Best practices, Red Hat provides a security guide with every major release of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We also provide a hardening guide around uh, SE Linux, and we have training and tooling. There's also audit log, you know, tooling around syslog, systemd, journal d. Uh, you may want to look at IDM, so you have authentication, authorization, uh, tooling. Security blog, Red Hat publishes, so we have a, good, a lot of good articles around container security, uh, Linux security. And then the particular analogy around Three Little Pigs, there's one for SE Linux as well as uh, for containers, and that's uh, downloadable as well in a PDF format. All right, so I want to thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Van Tyne again. I'm on LinkedIn as well as my email address at Red Hat is right there. Feel free to email me and I'll be happy to either answer your question or put you in touch with the appropriate folks at Red Hat. So thank you so much.